Hello, uh, my name is Malin Desai, and it is my privilege to bring to you this video discussing the role of imaging in operative management of patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I am at the Cleveland Clinic in Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and these are my disclosures. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as we all know, is characterized by left ventricular hypertrophy, which is out of proportion to what can be explained by other clinical means. It is most commonly seen in the septum and the anterior wall with a prevalence of about one in 500. It is typically transmitted uh, in an autosomal dominant mode. An important uh, aspect of HCM is that if looked for carefully, substantial proportion of them have dynamic outflow tract obstruction in about 70% of patients. However, as I'm going to uh, demonstrate, not all HCM is thick walls and not all thick walls constitute HCM. So we do need to have a tailored approach to management. So let's start with these uh, two examples that I'm gonna show you. The first one is a 54-year-old male with exertional dyspnea and syncope. As you can see in the four imaging panels, this patient has severe uh, basal septal hypertrophy in the left upper uh, column. And if you look at the right upper column, you see there is a lot of flow turbulence in the left ventricular outflow tract. Uh, which results in a severe uh, dynamic peak, late peaking outflow track gradient reaching about 60 millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> the cardiac MRI in the bottom right panel confirms everything that we showed, uh, including very severe basal septal hypertrophy. On the other hand, uh, let's talk about this patient. The, this is an 18 year old male who complained of excessive fatigue, dizziness with exertion, as well as a lot of palpitations. This patient, as most of us will agree, has no basal septal hypertrophy. Uh, and the MRI confirms that there is no basal septal hypertrophy. However, if you look at when we provoke this patient, what we are seeing is that there is severe dynamic outflow tract obstruction with reproduction of the symptoms in this patient. What we noticed this early on was this patient has a very prominent papillary muscle, best seen on the cardiac MRI. So are these both HCM? Of course, most of us will agree that the first one is a garden variety of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with thick septum, provocable gradient. This patient was gene negative for HCM. Case two, is this really hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Patient does have characteristic provocable gradient, but the mitral valve is normal and there is no hypertrophy. This patient was gene positive for HCM. So the first patient underwent standard surgical myectomy, but for the second patient, as people say, necessity is the mother of invention and we had to get creative and this particular patient underwent papillary muscle reorientation. So, it is important to recognize that multimodality imaging is crucial for diagnosis and phenotyping of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have four examples here. Uh, the top uh, left is a standard obstructive HCM. The top right is a patient with abnormal cordal attachment uh, causing outflow tract gradient. The bottom left is somebody with an apically displaced papillary muscle or MRI, and the bottom right has somebody who has bifid papillary muscles causing outflow tract gradient. Bottom line is all four have obstructive dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction. Echocardiography is the mainstay for diagnosis and phenotyping, however, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance CMR offers great complementary value. Step one in, in this thought process is you need to make a precise measurement of LV wall thickness, uh, which is where both the, the CMR but also transthoracic echocardiography uh, provide value. Uh, However, we need to recognize the strengths and limitations of everything. In this study that we have published a few years ago shows that the correlation between the two modalities is only moderate and it is not uncommon uh, 
to see smaller values measured on CMR compared to either transthoracic or surface or transesophageal echocardiogram. It is crucial to realize that echocardiography, you may be uh, cutting the image in an oblique plane and overestimate the, the measurements. And CMR, is uh, you can make a lot more precise measurements. So this is absolutely crucial as we are planning uh, for any procedure or stratifying this patient. It is also important, CMR can provide a complementary value to echocardiography in terms of the extent and location of LVH. These three patients have basal septal hypertrophy. However, most of us would realize that they are different and the extent of surgical myectomy would be very different in these three patients. Step two, it is absolutely important if you are suspecting in a symptomatic patient that they have obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy variant, you need to be able to elicit LV outflow tract gradient. The gradient could be at rest, it could be provocable, or it is not existent. Uh, so in order to do a full job, you need to look for basal septal hypertrophy. You need to understand what's happening to the mitral valve leaflets. Uh, where are they inserting? Are they associated with systolic anterior motion or not? And you need to understand what's happening to the papillary muscle. How, how many muscles are there? Are they uh, abnormally inserting? Are they hypermobile causing alpha track gradient? It is important to utilize all means to provoke outflow track gradient. That includes amyl nitride, valsalva, treadmill, upright bike. And if looked for carefully, uh, outflow track gradient is seen in about 70% patients. Obviously, echocardiography or stress echocardiography is the best way to be looking for this. It is important to realize that many patients will have latent outflow tract obstruction like this case where there is no basal septal hypertrophy and uh, it, there were some concern about papillary muscle problems. When we provoked this patient with amyl nitrite, the gradient that was non-existent became severe with significant symptom uh, eliciting. So it is crucial to realize Designating somebody as not being hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because they do not have LVH is not appropriate. Same way, designating somebody as non-obstructive HCM without the full extent of provocation is not appropriate. Systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve comes in various flavors. These are four examples, anterior leaflet SAM, posterior leaflet, bi-leaflet, or chordal SAM. And once you recognize this, we need to make sure it is not causing the full extent, uh, not causing L L significant outflow tract obstruction. Another important thing to keep in mind, especially as you are contemplating surgical planning, is if you have systolic anterior motion-related mitral regurgitation, the jet is posteriorly. If you have a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patient with an anteriorly directed jet of MR, like the panel on the right side, you have to worry about intrinsic mitral valve problem. And knowing that would be helpful because you may have to uh, plan uh, for an additional mitral valve repair. Another thing that we have recognized in our practice is as patients get older or the basal septum gets very hypertrophied, the angle between the LV inflow and LV outflow becomes uh, significantly abnormal, significantly closer to right angle. Uh, this uh, has an impact on outflow tract gradient and intraoperative visualization. This might impact uh, surgical approach as well as the extent of surgery. In our experience, this is best appreciated on either cardiac MRI or cardiac CT. Step three is recognize, as I've alluded to, other atypical variants of obstructive HCM. As I've shown, not all patients have basal septal hypertrophy. You have to be able to recognize the OCM without the H. You have to look for other players, including mitral and papillary muscles causing dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction. This is uh, based on a paper we published a few years ago. Uh, the cartoon talks about various scenarios 
of abnormal mitral subvalvular morphology causing outflow tract obstruction. So uh, panel A is normal, panel B is bifid hypermobile pap muscle, C shows apically displaced pap muscle, D shows thick papillary muscles, uh, you could also have abnormal caudal attachment or elongated uh, mitral leaflets uh, as seen in panels E and F. So it is not just one type of abnormality. There could be more than one that could be accounting for outflow tract obstruction. <clears throat> so these are three scenarios of atypical outflow tract obstruction. So the top panel involves some, a patient with very elongated anterior mitral valve leaflet causing dynamic outflow tract obstruction and uh, SAM-related MR. The middle panel is a patient with bifid hypermobile anterolateral papillary muscle causing outflow tract obstruction with provocation. And the third one is where the patient has abnormal caudal attachment causing dynamic outflow tract obstruction. MRI can be useful to further characterize the interplay between mitral valve leaflet and the degree of obstruction. This paper published a few years ago suggests that a ratio of anterior mitral length to LVOT diameter greater than two was potentially likely to be associated with outflow tract obstruction. <clears throat> Step four, it is always important when you are dealing with uh, LVOT obstruction, you need to recognize that there could be a scenario of subaortic membrane which can cause fixed outflow tract obstruction. This is important to recognize because in this situation, there may not be significant basal septal hypertrophy and the aortic valve in this situation could be affected to a point where it may need replacement. So how do you manage these complex patients? You have to recognize one size does not fit all. For majority of these patients, myectomy will be sufficient, a trigone to trigone myectomy and extend it all the way to a point where there is maximal hypertrophy, that will be sufficient. But for some other patients, as we have shown, you will have to get creative at the Cleveland Clinic when it comes to surgical relief of outflow tract obstruction, we strongly advocate a tailored approach. How do we do that? We use uh, imaging to guide decision-making for invasive therapy. You have to understand the interplay between septum mitral valve and papillary muscle. So if the only problem is basal septal hypertrophy as the panel in the, on the right, then you may choose to do surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. If there is issues with basal septal hypertrophy and mitral valve or papillary muscle, then we potentially could consider using a combination of myectomy and mitral valve repair. And if it is just a base, uh, papillary muscle or mitral valve problem, then we may end up doing a combination of pro uh, where the myectomy may only be a minimal myectomy. However, it is important, this requires planning and explicit discussion between cardiologists, imagers, as well as cardiac surgeon, and requires a lot of experience. So what are some of the common things we do at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in terms of mitral valve operations? The top, the panel A is where we would placate the elongated anterior mitral leaflet. If there is secondary abnormal chordae, then we would resect those uh, to allow the zone of co-optation to move posteriorly away from the outflow tract. And the panel C shows a surgical procedure that we do uh, fairly uh, often in such cases where we would uh, tack the hypermobile papillary muscle heads posteriorly away from the zone of coaptation, thus relieving outflow tract obstruction. It is important to recognize the role of intraoperative TE in planning for this procedure to help precisely guide uh, the extent of myectomy as well as these kind of operations and to look, make sure and ensure that there is adequate the dynam uh, relief of uh, dynamic outflow tract obstruction. So what is our experience? This is more than 2,200 myectomies, that uh, surgical reliefs of LVOT obstruction that we've done between 2002, 2018. And we have, Isolated myectomy was only done in 55% cases. The rest of them were combination. What we've shown is that <clears throat> the picture on the, the, the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right suggests 
that there is no additional outcomes penalty if we were to do a concomitant mitral procedure uh, in these patients. Uh, and we have shown that an earlier operation is associated with uh, significantly improved outcome compared to waiting for advanced symptoms to occur. So to conclude, obstructive HCM tends to be fairly heterogeneous with a varied phenotype. It is not all about LVH. You have to look for mitral valve and papillary muscle pathology, and the decision regarding invasive therapies should be individualized. In vast majority of the patients, myectomy will be sufficient. However, at Experience Center, in carefully selected patients, uh, we could also consider doing concomitant mitral valve papillary muscle procedures, which result in significant uh, uh, which results in excellent outcomes with long-term relief of our protract obstruction without an outcomes penalty. Thank you so much.